uh, welcome to Hopkins at home, or in this case, Hopkins in my home, my home office here. I'm delighted to see a couple familiar faces and names, and um, I, I think it's kind of neat. Uh, Hopkins connections go way back in my family. My uh, wife's grandfather was one of the founders of the School of Public Health. He was very, very involved in, um, up through his retirement in the 1970s. And my wife, Ginger, actually is a Peabody graduate. She did her master's in guitar at Peabody. Um, I guess I was contacted by the press. I don't want to tell you how long ago to write the book upon which this is based. Um, my co-author and I, uh, Elizabeth Schaff, um, we, we knew each other, worked with each other for a long time. But the good news is it was eventually published. Yes. And um, and for me, uh, it, it was a super fun year in 2017, 2018, when it came out, I was doing lots of book talks and going, going around face to face in those days. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and jump in. What I intend to do is uh, show some preliminary uh, images to just kind of get your minds uh, waking up to the variety of materials that we'll be dealing with. And uh, then I want to back off and do a sort of a brief mini lecture on what uh, what American music is in general, as opposed to that specific to Maryland. And then uh, I've got all sorts of fun things queued up. Uh, the websites that I'll share, um, I think rather than me trying to cut and paste them into the chat, I'll make sure that after the session, they're all signed over uh, and communicated outward to you so you can go and visit uh, some of these uh, really amazing resources, uh, some of which weren't around just a couple of years ago. So I am going to begin uh, with a little bit of a PowerPoint and some comments. Uh, a few centuries worth of, of music, the 1770s, the 1860s, into the mid 1900s, we have uh, such wonderful extremes of musical sounds that are connected to the state. And by the way, uh, the choice of the cover for the book Musical Maryland uh, was not mine. At first, I wasn't sure it would really work, but I've really grown to love it. It's quite appropriate. Uh, it's actually based on a piece of sheet music. And we'll, um, by the end of the evening today, uh, we'll listen to the song uh, called Sailing Down the Chesapeake Bay that was published over 100 years ago um, in uh, the sheet music that, again, was borrowed for the cover. In the upper left-hand side, uh, you see uh, the very wealthy Lloyd family of Maryland. This is Edward Lloyd IV and his wife and one of his daughters. These would become the in-laws of Francis Scott Key, a daughter yet to be born uh, would marry uh, Key. And Key married into a musical family. As you can see, Mrs. Lloyd is playing an instrument that's far out of fashion now, uh, and in fact was out of fashion by the early 18th, called a cittern, a Renaissance instrument. But it was brought back into fashion in the middle 18th century, and for about 50 years, it became uh, among the few that were very appropriate uh, for women to play. We'll talk about the role of gender uh, through the course of history of music. It's it's really a fascinating story. Um, below that, this is my hometown of Annapolis. I grew up not on the banks of the Severn, but the banks of the South River. And I'm coming to you from the banks of the Magathy River, uh, not too far away. Um, this reminds us right away that, that music uh, is not just for entertainment, not, not just a light activity, but that it is something uh, employed for something as serious as warfare. And we'll trace the history of military music from the French and Indian Wars up through uh, World War II, in fact. Uh, finally, on this page, we have a number of people who were born in Baltimore and who Baltimore can claim um, as, uh, as their people, and Billie Holiday is one of them. We'll, we'll, we'll get to her, uh, trust me. Um, another Baltimore born was Ann Brown. Uh, when Ann Brown heard that George Gershwin was planning a, an opera based on the book Porgy, and excuse me, the book was titled just Porgy. Uh, but it was Ann Brown who auditioned and got the role of Bess. And through the course of rehearsing and as things were unfolding, she and Gershwin uh, interacted quite a lot. And Gershwin eventually pulled her aside and said, uh, Ann, 
in the same way that there's always a Juliet with a Romeo and, and uh, we think of the great couples of history, uh, you're bringing so much to this show that I'm going to change the title from Porgy to Porgy and Bess. Um, and here she is with Todd Duncan uh, rehearsing, uh, preparing for the uh, original show in the 1930s. I've been teaching at Peabody since about 1993 or 1994, and these are some of my predecessors. Uh, very colorful people. Uh, this picture was done, uh, as you can see the date in the lower right, in 1872. Uh, and at that time, from left to right, let me tell you a little bit about some of these characters. Uh, Otto Sutro uh, was a student of Felix Mendelssohn before he came to America. He was quite an entrepreneur. Uh, he played the organ, he taught the organ, he conducted, he composed. Uh, when it turned out there might be gold in California, he gave up everything and went to, to hunt for gold for a while, but came back, luckily. Immediately to his right, with the lovely uh, mustache and beard, is uh, Asger Hemmerich. Uh, has, he was the third director at Peabody. The first two directors at Peabody, when it opened after the Civil War, were honestly uh, very ineffective. They, they didn't really know how to manage things, but Hemmerich did, and you'll be hearing his name a bit um, through this course. Um, next to him, uh, a violin teacher by the last name of Alan, Kate Dieter standing, the woman, she's a singer, she would join some of these soirees. Uh, next to him, uh, to her, excuse me, is another Peabody professor, Bernard Corleander, who uh, actually was the former piano teacher to the king and a princess of Denmark. Um, he was also friends with Hans Christian Andersen. So we find in Maryland by the late 19th century quite a cosmopolitan influx of some uh, musicians. You'll hear some stories later on about the seated cellist uh, and the fellow on the furth furthest part right who was a lawyer as well as a flautist. Another great uh, Baltimore-born was U.B. Blake, and uh, he's, he's responsible for this uh, major movement on Broadway uh, when, despite the racism that, that dominated things, uh, he was able, uh, together with an all-black cast and writers, uh, to pull off the first uh, really successful Broadway play that was entirely based. And um, you may know one of the songs from it, um, that was brought back for Truman's campaign song. Um, and we'll be listening to Baltimore Buzz, another song from this, uh, this wonderful show uh, as we get through the course of this evening. I'm so indebted to Peabody. Uh, there were two faculty development grants uh, that helped support uh, my part of the writing of the book over a period of time. Um, how stark does the conservatory look here? Uh, in this old photograph without the buildings uh, nearby. Um, we'll, of course, deal directly with Peabody and, and his amazing story as a young man coming to Baltimore and literally sweeping the floors of merchants' offices and eventually becoming the officer who ran uh, these uh, mercantile firms and later banking when he moved to London. Thank you, George Peabody and John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes the man in the upper right-hand side. That's uh, Tchaikovsky, who came to Baltimore in 1891. And I'd like to, sh to share uh, a little anecdote about his visit. I mentioned that Asger Hamerick, uh, that director of Peabody, was quite a mover and shaker. And um, he was the one who uh, instigated this arrival and um, in the spring of 1891. Uh, Tchaikovsky had agreed to come and conduct a concert in mid-May of that year at the Baltimore Lyceum, which still stands. It was only one of six appearances he made when he visited America at that time. And now a quote from Elizabeth's part of the book. After disembarking at the harbor, Tchaikovsky made his way to his hotel, where he met Ernst Knabe and the pianist Adele Austeau, a former Liszt student who was scheduled to perform Tchaikovsky's concerto in B-flat minor. Kanabi, whom I mentioned, a uh, very famous piano builder in the city of Baltimore. After an afternoon rehearsal at the Lyceum, a small orchestra made up of musicians, 
They went a, attended a lavish dinner and generous compliments of wine. Later, he retired to the conservatory and inspected a Kanabe piano um, that was play, that was there. And uh, my students each year, as we talk about Tchaikovsky coming, they some of them try to run around and figure out which piano, which actual one there, did Tchaikovsky perhaps touch. In the 1970s, uh, I was a lot younger, and uh, my mother was very involved in the Annapolis Fine Arts Festival. As a, as a kid, I was foolish not to attend the concert you see advertised here when Duke Ellington came and played at the Naval Academy. Okay, let's, uh, let's bounce back a little bit now. Uh, it, hopefully that's gotten your, uh, your brain waves uh, moving at a higher rate of speed. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and sort of outline how, how we can have a book on this topic, for one thing. You know, how can we justify? Uh, you, you don't see too many books on music in Kansas or music in Hi Idaho. Uh, these large Western states are, are rather uh, homogenous, and, uh, and yet Maryland isn't. And um, I'd like to show a few pictures to, to evidence that. Um, actually, here we are. Okay, so in the context of, of the greater U.S., of course, the, we need to address at the outset um, that there were native peoples uh, in North America for thousands of years. And the, the story of Native American music uh, over time unfortunately parallels the, uh, the story of the Native Americans themselves. Uh, and in the case of the eastern seaboard cities like Maryland, there are precious few accounts of the interactions between the first white settlers to arrive and the Native Americans. As we get uh, into the 19th century, however, um, scholars become interested in the Native Americans that are still around, that have been pushed down into Florida, out into the Midwest, Oklahoma, South Dakota, and so forth. Uh, so in a later class, uh, we'll talk about how uh, people in Maryland eventually heard uh, music inspired by those of the Native Americans, but that won't be something that happens early on. The big picture, of course, is that, that white settlement in North America, uh, the French were really good at, at coming in to the north side and the Great Lakes and the upper upper Midwest and so forth. And, that, and they brought with them uh, their, their love of the Catholic religion. And believe it or not, their accounts of uh, these French settlers uh, training uh, Native Indians to sing the, the mass in Latin. Same thing with the Spanish who came down and settled in Florida, modern-day Texas, up through Mexico, the Southwest, California. This is in the 1500s and 1600s. And, and so the initial exposure of North America um, was pretty varied from the European context. Not quite so, though, in Maryland, because Maryland's right in the heart of the successful English settlements. And yet it spans uh, this important uh, first few layers of land encountered by the visitors. We divide the state uh, into three basic geographic regions, the Atlantic Coastal Plain, Tidewater is what I refer this, uh, to this as. Um, this of course is where the first uh, British settled and, and began to set up the tobacco plantations that would characterize them until not too many decades ago. Uh, Piedmont, Piedmont Plateau would be fed by second and third waves of immigrants, many of them from Germany and the, the impact of German culture, German music, on Frederick County and, and uh, further up to the north, Carroll County and so forth, will be quite stark. And finally, of course, Maryland connects us out to the mountains. Um, we also then today end up with this extreme uh, of uh, population diversity. We have the intense I-95 corridor with Baltimore and Washington, and yet, you don't have to go too far over to the eastern shore or too far up uh, to the west and north in Maryland to find much more rural countryside. This will have a huge effect on musical development, uh, not just in the earliest periods, but to, this, uh, to the middle of the 20th century, for sure, and even to some extent today. Um, 
this is of course Tidewater, and uh, some of us who, those of us who grew up here, just just love it and can't leave it. Um, the effect of tobacco uh, will appear at the beginning of our next class when I sing a song about tobacco uh, that was imported and circulated through the colony of Maryland. Um, St. Mary's City, the initial uh, landing point of the Catholic settlement. Maryland was to be a Catholic colony, uh, and that ideal didn't last very long, less than 20 years. When the Calverts set up shop, uh, the politics of England shifted by the middle of the 1600s. In fact, that's the reason why the capital was moved from uh, St. Mary's City, well to the south, up to its current and final location in Annapolis. Annapolis was a Protestant stronghold surrounded originally by Puritans from Jamestown. And so politics will play uh, into the musical development of the colony and later state of Maryland. Uh, we get into the German country and further out into the mountains. This will definitely uh, affect how people live and thus uh, how they find recreation. Uh, probably the biggest impact of geography is on church music, sacred music, and uh, we'll be listening to some jarringly different examples of the kind of music sung in small rural churches uh, as opposed to the big uh, fine uh, structures built in Baltimore especially. Uh, sense of tobacco. Okay, so technology is something that's going to play a gigantic role uh, and some of the terminology associated uh, with technology and other things involve uh, the difference between primary and secondary sources. You historians out there probably know that the best way to study history is through primary sources, is to look at the actual documents. In the case of music, though, surprisingly few of them are directly musical in the early periods. We learn the most from newspapers, from broadsides, from account books, uh, from private correspondence. There isn't that much music that survives from the first 150 years worth of settlement in Maryland. And so we need to look uh, outward at some of these sources. Today we'll, we'll be scoping through a database of newspapers, finding some uh, surprising references, I think. The idea that uh, music doesn't have to uh, occur in a formal setting. It doesn't have to be played from uh, printed or manuscript music, but that it can be done in an oral or aural tradition uh, by those who simply grow up with it and learn how to sing music less formally or to play the fiddle less formally. Let's, um, let's see what some of that music looked like though. And here are some samples. I mentioned the German Influx. This is from Frederick, Maryland, in the mid uh, 1700s. The title page to a music book copied out by uh, Johann Thomas Schley, S C H L E Y, a family still uh, prominent in the city of Frederick, Maryland. Uh, Johannes and his son uh, were both organists and teachers and musicians, and their manuscripts survive and tell us not just about the church music going on in their Reformed German churches, but they also were quite involved in secular music. They, they copied out theater tunes and uh, dance music as well. Um, Benjamin Franklin, we'll, we'll cover him as he visited Annapolis uh, in the 1740s and intended a meeting of a very interesting social club. We'll talk about that next week. Here's the first American imprint of music up in New England. Uh, we refer to this uh, generally as the Bay Psalm Book. It was published in the Massachusetts Bay um, area at the one printing press up there at Harvard. The, uh, the very first uh, translation of the Psalms, very first book printed in the New World, at least north of Mexico, I should qualify, uh, was the text. Uh, of the Psalms as translated in 1640. This is a later edition uh, in 1709 when they were able to print the melodies to which the Psalms would be sung as well. And uh, there are references to this Psalm book finding its way as far south as Maryland. 
Magazines were a great way. This, this mag magazine was rescued from an estate on the South River about 50 years ago when the home, uh, home of the Worthingtons b burned. And this was one of the few things rescued from the house. Uh, it was printed in 1759. It's a magazine that shows uh, dances and um, songs that were available to those who could afford to uh, subscribe to magazines then. We're talking about instruments, the evolution of the guitar. The one I'll play tonight looks quite different from this. This is how they appeared by the beginning of the 19th century. We'll be talking about this very important piece of music that Francis Scott Key knew and loved. <clears throat> uh, we'll follow the course of dancing, such an important activity. And like almost every other part of music, uh, something that differed from social class to social class, from ethnic group uh, and between the races. And uh, it's, it's astounding to me as we look at the trail over the centuries of something like this colonial dance tune, an Irish jig, uh, copied out in the mid 18th century, how by the mid 19th century, uh, these will evolve into the barn dances and so forth of early America, and indeed adapted by the enslaved. These are some of the first uh, Irish style jigs transcribed from early sources here. This is a modern printed source of, um, of music that was associated with some of the enslaved fiddlers in the late 18th century and published, believe it or not, in Scotland. We, we were beginning to export some of our music that early. Um, play you a recording uh, later of this. My Peabody student sang this last year uh, as we studied uh, a Baltimore publication of sacred music to be sung in the big churches there in the city with organ accompaniment um, as compiled and published by a fellow named John Cole, a very uh, important businessman and socialite in the city of Baltimore. But the earliest sacred music to show up on the shores of the Chesapeake dates to 1728 and unfortunately, this document survives only as a copy of a microfilm, excuse me, as a microfilm that's a copy of an original, but the original is lost uh, for good. And so here we see some of these early psalm tunes um, as uh, kept alive and taught from in the 1760s in Annapolis when the first singing schools were opened in that city. So, wow, a lot of stuff already. Um, and, and I've already begun to, to refer to, to some of the, um, the yins and yangs, some of the backs and forths, the sacred versus the secular, the urban versus the rural. Uh, there'll be a big general transition from amateur music making in the early decades uh, to professional music making after the revolution. Uh, luckily, there, there is some of both uh, on either side, but the general trend uh, was for the evolution of a music industry. Uh, and of course, Baltimore is the home to that, starting in the 1780s and 1790s. The, the functions of music uh, we'll cover in just a moment, but I'd like to go ahead and, and have you hear a couple of recorded examples of uh, some of these other, uh, not a dichotomy here, but a trichotomy. If we think of music as being broken down between a classical designation, popular, and folk. For the classical, uh, I draw your attention to the website that contains a bunch of good music examples that go along with the book musical, Maryland. And uh, the URL will be emailed to you soon. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a supplemental material on the Johns Hopkins University Press page. and. I've written a bit of an introduction to it, uh, given some credits to the various contributors of these recordings. We all gave them free of charge and free of copyright. And uh, our first example of classical music uh, comes from the music library of Charles Carroll of Carrollton. We'll be looking at the harpsichord that he commissioned in the late 18th century and the musical activities of his daughters into the 19th century. But I thought this might be a good way to get a little bit of a sense of classical or more formal music. Sometimes I prefer to refer to it as art music. Let's listen to just a minute or so to one of the organ voluntaries 
um, composed by the blind English organist John Stanley. It's a two movement voluntary and it's obviously designed to be played by someone who's highly trained uh, and uh, to be uh, featured on some of the lovely organs uh, that were being built after the revolution in the fine churches around the state. As an example of popular music, I'd mentioned the Noble Blake, uh, excuse me, UB Blake and Noble Sissel's uh, um, Broadway show had been such a success and uh, maybe we could hear uh, uh, one of the hit songs of it, known as Baltimore Buzz. Um, this was recorded by um, our, our friend who contributed, uh, Bill Beal, who contributed some of the illustrations and some of the sidebar write-ups uh, to the book. He, he was a big fan of barbershop-style singing. And um, so here, let's go to the 1920s and hear a song that was popular beyond the city of Baltimore uh, as the show enjoyed so much success uh, again, this comes here from the uh, sample recording page, um, Baltimore Buzz, here it is. Listen while we tell you about a thing that's happening here in town or there. Uh-huh. Like a thousand raggy draggy dances that, sure enough, are dancing every hall and there. You bet. And in a thousand raggy draggy prances that, uh -huh. I pranced at every ball, but the bestest one that was is called the Baltimore Buzz. I don't know about you all, but it's kind of hard to keep my feet still as I'm sitting listening, listening to that. Um, and finally, as an example of folk music, uh, let's go to uh, let's go to a little informal gathering at a farmer's market. I must confess, I shot that video up in New England last fall, but those kinds of gatherings are frequent uh, here throughout the country. The informal, the joy of playing, uh, playing music for fun, getting together is uh, often a, um, it's a real treat. I want to be sure, though, before going uh, much longer, uh, to, uh, to include something live. Um, it's great to have access to recordings, it's fun to look at images and videos, but um, I'm going to, to pull out uh, a very old style guitar and, and share with you uh, a story and a song that helped lead us into the colonial period that we'll focus on next week. And it will go like this. <clears throat> First of all, I'll, I'll introduce you to the instrument. Um, this is a copy. Uh, I'll show you a close up right away what everyone's interested in. Notice the sound hole. It's not empty. It's got this lovely layered carved paper rosette. And in the oldest days of guitars and the lutes before them, um, the empty sound hole was not a thing. They were always decorated. This is a very fancy instrument. It's got exotic woods. It's got purfling. Um, you may see the ten tuners on the back and the sides. This was known um, by then, excuse me, back in the day, simply as guitar, or in some cases differentiated as the Spanish guitar. You may recall the one in the lap of Mrs. Lloyd I showed at the outset was known as an English guitar. And so there were two guitar families coexisting in the 19th century. What, what I find fun to do is to trace hopefully I'll be able once I get my new laptop computer um, I'll be able to sing from our more comfortable studio down in the basement um, instead of here in the office and not in a creaky chair. Um, but what I'd like to do is to share a, a melody that uh, demonstrates the importance of something called parody. I'll be coming back to parody over and over again through this course. Parody in musical sense doesn't mean to make fun of something, but it means to borrow a melody and put new words to it. That's what Francis Scott Key did with our national anthem. 
That's what the capital steps do when they go and they do their humorous renditions of politically charged lyrics set to older familiar tunes. And not just in the world of secular music, but in sacred music as well, uh, we find that the reusing of old familiar tunes uh, with new words is, is the way things worked on the majority case before the revolution, uh, less and less after as music printing becomes more common. But it still is with us today. Uh, I, I, I would sing for you some of the parodies of Beatles songs I wrote when I was in college, but they're all kind of off color, so I don't think that would be really appropriate. But let's, let me trace a melody that tells the stories of, of some very important things. Uh, theater and the military are both addressed by a song that dates back to the 1690s in print, which means that it was probably sung who knows how much sooner than the 1690s in oral tradition. But it was collected as, as a love song and published in a book that shows up. Actually, I found my copy in the Peabody Library. Um, and uh, that's one of the illustrations uh, from that book uh, shows up in the first chapter of the book. But the song is called Jockey and Jenny. And it's also known by the first line of the chorus, which is over the hills and far away. Maybe some of you my age and older uh, remember nursery rhymes, including um, Tom Tom the Piper's Son. The only tune that he could play was Over the Hills and Far Away. And you're about to learn why uh, the, the title remained um, in use up till my childhood, at least. Here's, here's just a, two verses and a chorus of this simple little love song about Jockey and Jenny. These are sort of two idealistic, uh, rustic uh, folks, a couple who were courting out in the countryside. Jockey met with Jenny Fair at the dawning of the day, but Jockey now is full of care since Jenny stole his heart away. Although she promised to be true, she's proven Alas, unkind, which makes poor Jockey often rue that ere he loved a fickle mind, and it's o'er the hills and far away, o'er the hills and far away, over the hills and far away, the wind has blown my plaid away. Now, as any good ballad, it would go on for verse and verse and verse and, and uh, project the story over time. And luckily these survive and were sung. I just wanted to introduce you to the melody though, as it was at least 300 uh, years and more ago. In England, by 20 years after this or so, uh, the English were fighting the Spanish and they decided, let's take that, over, that Jockey and Jenny song and let's write a recruiting song to try to get soldiers to join the army and go over the hills to fight, over the seas to fight. So it turns from a love song in the 1690s to a recruiting song in the 1715 uh, or so. But by 1728, a very important theatrical piece is conceived in London. It's called The Beggar's Opera. If you've ever heard the song Mac the Knife that was popularized by many in the 20th century, uh, Mac the Knife, the character uh, on the Three Penny Opera, was based on the Captain Mac Heath of the Beggar's Opera in 1728. This is the opera that came to Maryland in 1752, was given at Annapolis, at Upper Marlboro, in Chestertown, Maryland, at Port Tobacco, Maryland. And in 1728, by that time, the song had gone from love song to recruiting song, now it's back to a love song. So here's how the people in Maryland heard this tune. Were I laid on Greenland's coast, and in my arms embraced my lass, warm amidst eternal frost, too soon the half year's night would pass, and I would love thee every day. Every night we'd kiss and play, if with me you'd fondly stray over the hills and far away. It's such a nice little simple tune. 
In the opera, there are only two verses to it, but it's very catchy. Uh, the m melodic range isn't that great. It's a little bit repetitive. And we'll find quite soon that people pick it up on their fiddles to play as a dance tune, that the fifers in the French and Indian War will pick it up to play as a march. And in fact, that's where this next takes us. Because just two years after it was done, in, the Beggar's Opera was done in Annapolis, in the theater down, this would have been the one down uh, Duke of Gloucester Street in the Carroll property at a made up um, warehouse was used in impromptu fashion to be the first theater in Annapolis. Just two years later, if you look at the Maryland Gazette newspaper, you will find printed, quote, a recruiting song for the Maryland Independent Company by an officer of the company. Tune over the hills and far away. I'll share just a couple of verses of that. And we'll find now again, the purpose, the function of this song is back to warfare, to something full of testosterone, get out the, over those hills and fight the French and the Indians in this case. Here, here are two verses and two choruses. I'll sing it a little more robustly, of course, because that's what the words call for. Over the hills with heart we go To fight the proud insulting foe Our country calls and we'll obey Over the hills and far away And it's over the mountain's dreary waste To meet the enemy we haste Our king commands and we'll obey Over the hills and far away Whoever is bold, whoever is free, will join and come along with me to drive those French without delay over the hills and far away. Then on fair Ohio's banks we'll stand, musket and bayonet in hand. The French are beat, they dare not stay, but take to their heels and run away. It's September 1754. And again, the verses will be many. In those days, people weren't rushing off to check their emails and their iPhones and stuff like that. People wanted substance to their songs, especially the ballads. They needed details. They didn't have video instant uh, replays from protests on the streets of some city. Instead, uh, when the battles of the American Revolution are turned into song, and when the, the sea battles of, of 1812 are fought out in the ocean, people want detail. They want to hear about the blood and the gore and the guts and so forth, and the heroes and etc. And so there's just one little melody. Uh, it, it keeps active into the War of 1812. Uh, the, it's done, actually, the Beggar's Opera is done in Baltimore in the 1850s. And so uh, this melody stayed alive long enough. Um, and to be recognized, many people watch Sharp's Rifles on television. It's the theme song to a, a series on TV, even today. So that's just one little me melody. There are lots of them. And, and they take us through uh, uh, these rich parts of history that in some cases are not as rich if you just read history books. The, the music has a way to convey the sense of immediacy this, the sense of opinion, the sense of humor sometimes will emerge through the songs of a day that won't show up in the officer's reports, uh, that won't show up in the newspaper reports. Um, when we get to 1812, I'll, I'll sing you a wonderful Yankee Doodle parody called The Battle of Baltimore. Got it right in my hands. This is published side by side with the Star Spangled Banner, but it's a very different take on the British who were attacking by land and the British who were hurling the bombs and rockets toward Fort McHenry. This gives us a view that Francis Scott Key didn't have because he was a gentleman. This is a low class song. So we'll, we'll get to that one in a couple of classes. Back to a really fun screen I think you would like to see. <clears throat> People get very, um, they're important. <laughs> and the musical instruments that they will play let me just rifle through some, some wonderful uh, images associated. This one, not specifically with Maryland. This is just, uh, just up over the northern border in Pennsylvania in the mid-1780s. Man, did you know Quakers could dance? They, they love it. 
And in fact, this gives us a very different view from the formal minuets that are described by the wealthy families down in the tidewater. But Germans love to dance as well. And here they are with two fiddles and a French horn and just whooping it up. And the players are drinking wine, it looks to me like, too, by the red vessels and cups there at their table. We've seen this picture already. I can't wait to share some of the poetry and music of the Tuesday Club of Annapolis next week. This, this society was active for over a decade. Uh, they composed the first known chamber music in British North America. They hosted Benjamin Franklin as a visitor and, and governors of this and other colonies as well. Very, very rich story. At the other extreme of, of more sophisticated music, we see one of the finer musicians from Maryland, the young Eliza Ridgely when she's only 15 years old. I'll send you a link to a wonderful little 13-minute uh, sort of video vignette on the, about this painting by Thomas Sully and uh, the young musician who would grow up to be quite the um, socialite in uh, Baltimore. Her house, of course, still survives up above the Baltimore Beltway at uh, Hampton Plantation as a national historic site. The most important ingredient, of course, in the history of music in every area of North America uh, will be the elements brought from Africa and uh, instruments specific to Africa, such as the banjo here is how it has evolved in this country. And the incorporation of the European dance tunes, but imbued with African syncopations uh, with a diff different sense of participation in uh, African musical practice. Um, this is a wonderful thread of history. Uh, that we'll trace. And speaking of that carol harpsichord, here it stands. This lovely, refinished, playable. Unfortunately, it's not in Maryland. We need to get it back. It's owned by a private school up in Connecticut. I think we need to do some fundraising and make them an offer they can't refuse to bring it back because down at Mount Vernon, they just made a reproduction of George Washington's harpsichord, which coincidentally, I believe, was copied almost exactly after the specifications that Carol submitted in 1789 for the Washington harpsichord that was finished a few years ago and delivered to Philadelphia. Charlie Bird. <laughs> I love it when I'm, when I'm actually able to teach in my classroom at Peabody, which is next to Joe Bird Hall for the jazz world. Um, it's always fun to show my students uh, who Joe Bird was and his big brother, Charlie, and uh, the impact that these guys had. I remember seeing Charlie when he first came to the Maryland Inn uh, and uh, Paul Pearson uh, brought in lots of jazz greats like Earl Hines to play the piano. Uh, I got to see as a kid in that revival of jazz um, in the 1970s. It was a wonderful period of time. Here's where pianos ended up. Um, this is a, a fine Baltimore built Kanabe uh, piano. You need about nine men to move something like this when it's time to go. The Civil War uh, evokes uh, the chivalry of old times, and um, we'll be examining a uh, sketchbook uh, from a Southern prisoner who was imprisoned at Point Lookout, Maryland, and his drawings uh, imagining the life he had left behind. Here is a woman plucking away on some type of guitar. I, I think it's a little imaginary. Um, Rosa Poncel, the great opera singer who retired to Baltimore and helped found the Baltimore Opera. Here she is in the arms of en Enrico Caruso. Uh, these Tuesday Club guys, again, will, will be to them. And I mentioned the importance of this, of the music, but also the dancing, the drumming, the, the participatory uh, music that will so heavily influence the popular music in the state of Maryland. And that one we had on the first slide. I love this early picture of, taken from the Peabody Conservatory of, um, sorry, it's kind of small, um, the first monument to George Washington there at, at Mount Vernon uh, in Baltimore. There are a few websites I think you might have some fun with, and I'm, I'll take you to one of them right now. This is an interactive map of Baltimore. And uh, it was created by uh, students at UMBC and in conjunction with others, I don't recall right now, it says so on the website. But I, I love this interactive digital map 
because you can zoom around the city of Baltimore uh, as it was in 1815 and you can find places of worship. You can find the theater, the dance hall. You can see Fort McHenry and so forth. I'll give you just a little quick, quick little taste of this one. Although I get stuck in these things and I could, uh, I could spend a half an hour here. Um, let's, let's go and take a peek at this map. It is right here. And let's go full screen on this one. We deserve it. Isn't that beautiful? It's a bird's eye view from the north, obviously, looking down. If you wish to get oriented in uh, some of the features of today, you can see where the stadiums are and you can see the inner harbor and how the docks have been built out over time. But the beauty of this, uh, this particular map is you can go wherever you want. You can go down to Fort McHenry and see what it looked like in 1815. And what a great thing to be looking at and thinking about uh, as you study the Star Spangled Banner, which we will do in great detail, because that's one of the most important stories that Maryland has to give to the country. But you can also go to the Indian Queen Motel. This is where Francis Scott Key came a few days after the bombardment of Fort McHenry. Uh, this is where he spent the night and purportedly sketched out whatever verses were bouncing around through his head got them onto paper and had them sent down to the Baltimore American News Office to be printed and circulated, especially down to the fort, by way of thanks to those who had defended the city of Baltimore. By the way, the Star Spangled Banner was initially entitled The Defense of Fort McHenry. You can go to the theater, which not coincidentally, unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore today. This is over by Modern City Hall. But here we have the Holiday Street Theater that stood well into the 19th and I believe early 20th century, right next door to the assembly rooms. This is the dance hall of those who uh, could afford to subscribe and pay the fees to come and be involved in dancing. And as you explore this map, you'll notice some things are uh, flashing blue, which means you can click for more details. You can see some pictures of uh, these specific places, how they looked before. You can notice this playbill that mentions the Star Spangled Banner is going to be sung at that theater on a certain date here um, more than a half a year after the events. Um, the, my favorite, and I'll leave you with this one, where to go, is the cathedral, the first Catholic pro-cathedral constructed in the United States was under construction in 1815 it would contribute dramatically to the music history of the city. It wouldn't open for another six years, but when it did was the first performance of the fully orchestrated performance of Handel's Messiah given in America. The organ installed in the new cathedral uh, had the greatest number of pipes of any in the country when it was built. It was over 2,000 pipes built on it. There, um, other websites that we'll be going uh, on to later on. But I, I'd love for you to hear another recorded piece of music with a tremendous uh, connection to the city. I take you now to the Lester Levy sheet music collection. And it's composed by a very interesting fellow. Notice this, the full formal uh, expensive engraved sheet music here. The Carrollton March performed at the ceremony of commencing the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad on the 4th of July, 1828 dedicated by permission to the Honorable Charles Carroll of Carrollton by A. Clifton. Well, A. Clifton or Arthur Clifton is a pseudonym. It was a guy who had to leave England in disgust. Uh, he was chased out of town because he was caught with the wrong Lord's mistress. <laughs> he had, his name, original name was uh, Corey, Philip Corey. And he was doing quite well as a musician in London until I got into this fray. He escaped, came to Baltimore, settled, changed his name, and you'll hear his name a bunch of times because he helped set up the social society called the Anacreontic Society of Baltimore. And he composed a number of pieces. He composed an opera, the first op formal opera called The Enterprise he composed in Maryland. So I'll play you out with a recording done by a colleague of mine when I was in grad school, a fellow named Bob Gallagher. He'll be playing, uh, this by the way, is another of those that is, resides here on the sample music site. 
uh, here it is, the Carrollton March. In this case, I credited it to, to his real name. It's recorded on an early piano forte. That's why the sound you will hear is not the full, clean, warm, crisp sound of a modern grand piano. It's rather clunky and dinky sounding. That's how they were in 1806. Um, but we were fortunate to gain use of the specific pianoforte down at the Hammond Harwood House in Annapolis when we did, made this recording in 1990. Um, so I will uh, play us out here at 6.30 um, and thank Sarah and Vicki and others for inviting me to, to jump in and teach this class. I hope you found enough of interest to come back next week. Um, and I will let this piece play out in its entirety. And I'll stay on if anybody has any other questions here within a couple of minutes after it has played. The Carrollton March. <laughs>